Good morning, folks. And what a wonderful little story we have in the world of people leaving BioWare and the people that you are more interested in hearing about for leaving BioWare or have left BioWare and their experiences therein and why things are happening the way they are. So here we have Drew Carpershin, who is a writer, so he's not technically leaving or part of BioWare. He gets hired to do a job, then he leaves. Writers jump in and on or off of projects all the time, and they're called in for specific tasks. So here's a little story from Drew, uh, his time when BioWare started. So the lead writer of the first two Mass Effect games is now the lead writer at Archetype Entertainment, and we're going to talk about that later. And he shared some telling insight into how we got there. So he's been writing, and he has in the design credits of many beloved Bioware games, Mass Effect, Mass Effect 2, Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic, Neverwinter Nights, Jade Empire, and Anthem. Okay, <laughs> Anthem may not be beloved, but that's not all the writing's fault, that's true. Although I would argue it's a just everything about Anthem is has problems. In the, in the blog post that updated Carpentry's fans on his creative pursuits over the last few years, he was frank about his experience with Bioware, a company that he actually left twice, once in 2012 and once in 2018, after rejoining the studio to work on Anthem. I've been in the video game industry for 20 years now. When I started at Bioware, everything was fresh and exciting. It was a dream job. Talented people working together to create epic games like Baldur's Gate, KOTOR, Mass Effect, and Dragon Age. Those are the big four. That is the four games that Bioware has been known as making a quality product of. I haven't really talked about Baldur's Gate. I'm still talking about KOTOR. I know I'm lazily getting around to the, doing that plot analysis just on writing alone. But Baldur's Gate is a whole other ballpark of conversation. It's You're talking about an era, the end of an era, why it's still popular, why it's still around, uh, certain media that does and does not have voice acting. And, and versions therein of the real-time with pause engine. So you really have to be a connoisseur of the Infinity Engine-style games to appreciate Baldur's Gate, and then KOTOR, Dragon Age, and then Mass Effect. Like It's different. Yeah, these, I think these were released in that order, but uh, it's you, you have to appreciate what came before to, to get all these games. But as we grew and became more successful, things changed. We became more corporate. We were less able to make what we loved. And the teams were pushed to create games based on market research rather than our creative instincts and passions. I could feel what he's talking about because I get when you get popular or you get a product that people want, you have to then make a second product or service that does exactly what the previous one did, only better, which is based on market research. And the thing with a writer, though, is that every writing you do, you are forced to be put in a box. It doesn't matter. Let's say you're writing for yourself. And you think, oh, my imagination is free. Yeah, your ideas are free. But you're still within the confines of, oh, I'm writing a book. I'm writing a screenplay. I'm writing a novella. What kind of novella? Is it a certain genre? So all, automatically your ideas are being focused and put in a box. Then you're focused on, well, how long is the novella going to be? What's it going to be about? How many chapters? How many pages? How many paragraphs? How many words? How many ideas? So whether you're doing it from an individual perspective like that or you're working for a newspaper or a video game company or whatever, they're going to say, we need a character that does this. Can you, can you work around that? So to me, it's really about how comfortable are you with premises that aren't your own? When someone tells you, hey, I want you to do that within this world. That's really all it is. And if you like those premises, if you like writing about those things, your, your psychology will be great. I love this idea. I'll be happy to write that. As opposed to, well, I'm a professional writer. I could write anything. I'm amazing. I'm going to do this. Reg like you give Harlan Ellison random ideas when he was still alive. That's what he would do. He would just, as an experiment, he's like, give me random ideas out of a hat. I'll write that story. And he can write very quickly with two fingers on his typewriter. So the mark of a good writer is obviously someone who's written a lot, but can deal with ideas that are either contradictory or not what he not what he wants to write. And he'll do it anyway, because he's that good at putting together ideas in a certain way, which might sound like a mess. And it probably does read like a mess when you have all these crazy ideas coming out and they have to be fit. They, they're forced to fit with on the page but that's the mark of a good writer. So 
Personally, psychologically, I understand where Drew is coming from, but as as a person to make things, as a media creator, uh, just gotta get go with it, do your job, and and pump out good quality stuff, regardless of the ideas and the limitations you're given. And writing is the cheapest and fastest way to do that when you're talking about multimedia. My dream job just became a job, and I lost the enthusiasm and excitement I once had. Again, I, I understand that, um, but every job becomes a job. Writing a, writing a story, even if it's you're enthusiastic at, at first, becomes a job. Day in, day out, you got to do your eight hours. you got to write that story down. And you might like doing it because it's your own ideas. It's your own concepts, your own passions. But you still have to write. You have to go through all the editing. You have to go through all the typing, all the text editors, and all the the uh, the sentences, and all the, the typos, and all the re-edits, and the reviews, and the removing things, and adding stuff back in. That's called writing. You have to do it. So I'm like, hey, Drew, I know where you're coming from, man. And at the same time, it's like, you know, it's if it's not worth your time, I get it. Okay, cool. But to me, a job's a job. Bioware has it endured an exodus of senior leadership in recent years. Yes. And that's James Olin. And we're going to talk about it soon. And not to end on a downer, Carpenter added that his passion for making games has been rekindled at his new place of work, which is Archetype. With Bioware, I was part of a legacy that will endure forever. We created some of the most beloved CRPGs of the past two decades, but I truly believe in Archetype. We have the talent and the opportunity to do something just as amazing. So... Archetype is apparently the new Bioware, and we're going to talk about that for a bit here. A chance for the creators of Baldur's Gate and Star Wars, the Old Republic, to create something special. Okay. I don't know how many people who have left Austin are now part of Archetype, aside from the big two, uh, and, and Drew, of course. But other than that, meh, we don't know. And uh, just for some some wonderful information on Mr. Olin here, was the dungeon master of the pen and paper campaign that gave birth to Baldur's Gate. So this is the original dude who helped build the game for Baldur's Gate. And he was at Bioware for like 20 years. Rather than play with the kind of optimized uber heroes who tend to start computer RPGs, the group rolled deeply flawed characters and stuck with them. Khalid was a fighter with an underwhelming strength stat. I remember. <laughs> I thought he was a ranger, but... Oh, sorry, that was Minsk. Uh, which contributed to a personality defined by low self-esteem. And he was married to that uh, Jahira. So she, he was kind of... Be- <laughs> like, that. that's cool. You, you, When you write a character, you give him flaws immediately. And there you go. Minsk was great. Minsk was a barbarian, uh, a barbarian ranger who had a habit of, of keeling over during combat. I, oh, really? So, and so his player... Cameron Topher invented a hamster psychic to run around the battlefield in Mintz's stead. I thought that was just a joke. I don't I don't know the hamster actually run around. Obviously, in, in PNP, you can get away with a lot more things. But Minsk was crazy. Like, he was just totally nuts. He thought his hamster was from space. And uh, every, every character in, in the Baldur's Gate world is always interesting whenever you pick them up. So... Uh, that, that, that's why you love these games. The characters are so much fun. And that's where you see the inspiration for Dragon Age, why you have all this dialogue, all these party interactions, because that's the fun part of doing, well, writing, from my understanding, and from doing creative stuff. When you do pen and paper games, you have these wonderful stories of characters acting out ridiculous scenarios. These unconventional party members shaped the breath, the breakthrough RPG that followed lending Baldur's Gate an irreverence that balances doomy proclamations and political intrigue. They also taught players to embrace imperfection. If you picked the assertive healer and Druid Jahera, you had to take her husband Khalid too and find a way to make them work, or him work, perhaps discovering his potential as the party's bulwark. You can still see that inclusivity in Bioware's DNA today. That's, that's stupid. That's, I, this is, I don't know who this writer is, Jeremy. Um, that's a silly way of putting... Inclusivity is a very specific term used only through popular culture these days. When you're talking about diversity and you want to include people from other uh, backgrounds, social or ethnic. 
So, uh, yeah, it's not wrong. It's just, I just don't like that, that term. And uh, especially when you're talking about Bioware today, Bioware today is not very good in terms of quality, in terms of storytelling. You can't put much story into a four-person looter-shooter game. You, you could try. I mean, there's ways to do it, but we all can say storytelling is not the focus or the quality element of Anthem if there is a quality element in Anthem to talk about. It's not story. Which is why it matters where James Olsen goes. Early this month, he announced the founding of a new studio with an old buyer, Austin Mucker. Chad Robertson, Archetype Entertainment, is an autonomous division of D&D owners, Wizards of the Coast, who make story-driven RPGs with a focus on impactful choices, which is all we ever wanted from Bioware. And Bioware is not giving us that, or has stopped giving us that. We are building games that represent the diversity of our audience, studio says on the site. Uh, again, another one of those terms I don't, not too comfortable with. In terms of this, this could mean many things. Uh, he could refer to the diversity of his RPG audience, of the hardcore and the softcore, the guys who love story-driven stuff or choice stuff or action stuff. Who knows? It, it could be referring to other ethnic groups, but I don't think so. We also believe that game studios should empower top developers and challenge them with ambitious projects that are shaped by a strong, clearly communicated creative vision. Yes. Yes, a hundred times. Clearly communicated creative vision this is the problem with bioware as of late they do not have a clear vision a clear goal a clear product that they have to build they have too many uh, chefs in the kitchen they have too many ideas and they're not focusing and things have to come slammed together at the last minute and that's where you get projects like Androm. that's where you get pretty much all of bioware's products even the good ones came together because they have to produce a product, make something. And it really helps when you have a clear vision before you get to that point in development where you're forced to sit, drop it all and say, we got to get this out the door. It's a statement that recalls some of the limitations Olin faced at Bioware, a studio he co-founded that has often gone underappreciated. And we're going to talk about the Old Republic because Austin was the one that was set up to make the Old Republic it was criticized on release for too closely resembling World of Warcraft. Well, you know, that was their main competitor. When he left in 2018, he expressed regret that he hadn't steered the project further from his most obvious inspiration. Okay, that's fine. I was the game director, which meant I had the most power. But I often felt like I was the captain of the Titanic and I could just steer it a tiny, teeny, tiny bit if I put all my efforts into it. This is such an ironic phrase. The jokes that we have made or have been made about the Old Republic on release have called it the Tortanic, T-O-R, the Old Republic, Tortanic, because of its ridiculous launch and various changes it's made over the years. Now, recently, past few years, the Old Republic has actually done very well in terms of quality product meaning the storytelling, the, the characters you could choose, the classes have their own unique path. And all the characters you meet, how you deal with them, this is all what people expected at the beginning. And now it's after all this time, they finally figured out what works, which is give us a single-player style quality story in a multiplayer online game. Who knew, right, that the things that Bioware was, would have been known for are the still things people want. You know, the expectations were met when Bioware produces an RPG and they don't produce the RPG people want. You get something called the Tortanic. So it's ironic that Mr. Olin is saying he's, he felt like he was the captain of Titanic and he just, if he just could do this, it's like, nope, you're still going to crash. Nevertheless, the Old Republic contains some of Bioware's finest adventures, I can't argue that because I haven't played them, but I have talked to people who have, and they said it's been done very well. And that's that's all we want. We want quality stories from a, a studio like Bioware. The studio commented on to filling the game with multiple origin stories. Once they got the obligatory Jedi Knight and Sith Warrior campaigns out of the way, they dug deep into the roles that rarely get the spotlight. Smuggler, bounty, bounty hunter, imperial agent. 
the latter cast you as essentially a caretaker to the Sith cleaning up after the impulsive, messy, and strategically ill-advised killing sprees. Doesn't that sound like a fascinating perspective for an RPG? Yes, it does. The seedy underbelly of Star Wars. All the side stories that aren't related to Jedi or Sith. The, the other guys on the side. The Imperial agent who still has some leeway. That's the kind of stuff we wanted to see. We wanted to see new, sto- new stories, essentially. So you want different perspectives from Jedi and Sith. In the years since Bioware Austin has perfected its craft in primarily single-player expansions like Knights of the Fallen Empire, which relished the moral complexity of the Jedi-Sith alliance. You take one thing, one element out of KOTOR, the, the, the balance between the Jedi and the Sith, the, the, the permutations, the relationships, the scenarios, and that's it. That's all you do. That's fine. It works. Wow, what an idea. While the world gobbled up any rumor or soundbite about Knights of the Republic 3, the studio quietly built worthy successors to the name. Eventually. Eventually it did. Again, I can't argue that because I haven't played it, but I have on good authority that people who have played it in detail, and you can check out Ex Letalis' uh, channel. He has a whole bunch of playthroughs. All kinds of stories about that. By 2014, it seemed as if Bioware Austin would finally get to create something for itself, and fittingly, that breakdown game would be inspired by tabletop D&D, Shadow Realms. Oh, boy. There's a, there's a wonderful story of uh, Bioware um, biting off more than they could chew, having marketing take over, and having all this hype over a game that wasn't yet released. We only saw a demo at one of the E3s over the years, and then it just got canceled, which is just, just sad. Seem they would are the key word. Shadow Realms was later canceled in favor of extra hands on Dragon Age. Inquisition and Mass Effect Andromeda, two games that, uh, well, obviously an, an Inquisition sold well, so bravo Bioware for your marketing. But uh, gameplay, storytelling, oof, not as, not as good as it could have been. Not to say that Inquisition was a complete wash or that uh, the majority or... The minority of Andromeda was a complete wash. I'm sure there were some great stories in Andromeda I haven't seen, but few and far between. Inquisition, again, standard stuff. Just make what you've done previously, rely heavily on dialogue and character interactions, which I think they did. Just the main story, the plot was just a mess. And it's it's like, it's, it's Mass Effect 2 all over again. Wonderful side stories with wonderful characters, horrible everything else in the story. So I'm not even going to talk about the antagonist. That was just a, just a mess. So the development of Anthem followed the same pattern. Despite its years of experience, Bioware's only online game, Austin was relegated to second studio. Uh, that is that is a minor point. Yes, less funds were put here and there. But we're talking about a concise, clear vision Clearly communicated, create a vision. That's what you needed for those games, and they still did not get them. According to the report on the making of Anthem, some staff in Austin found their expertise dismissed and were frustrated by the lack of clear direction from Edmonton. Too many uh, chefs in differing kitchens, or in, in very far away kitchens. Uh, another recipe for disaster. It may well be Bioware Austin who ultimately sculpts Anthem into something worth playing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Anthem Next, Anthem 2.0, Anthem World Reborn, since the studio took over live services after launch, but a confused game with a terrible reputation is hardly a fitting reward for all that patience. This is true. Archetype Entertainment then represents a chance for former Bioware Austin staff to make something for themselves. Its first project in a, is a science fiction RPG, but with Withers of the, Wizards of the Coast on board, it must only be a matter of time before Olin returns to his D&D table. And thank goodness for that. I would love to see a reinvention of KOTOR with a new IP with people from Bioware who have left and said, we're doing it the right way, the proper way. And thank goodness for that. That's a good thing. And may, who knows, maybe uh, Archetype is going to be the, the, the new... The, the new, what is it, um, Obsidian to Black Isle. Like, like Bioware would be a Black Isle and well, Archetype would be Obsidian. That would be a, a nice 
nice way of putting it. Obviously, we have to wait a few years for anything uh, noteworthy to come out or anything at all. So that's just uh, a wonderful two bit of stories from, from Games Radar. Hope you guys enjoyed my commentary. Thanks for listening. Have yourself a great morning.